Praise the Lord, everybody. Let's go to the Word of God right now. Deuteronomy 6 and 4. Anybody recognize that verse? Yes. Amen. I figured I'd stay on the safe side today. <laughs> Amen. I love oneness doctrine. And uh, when I was a Trinity preacher, I had a whole series of radio programs I did on the Trinity. I still got those old reel-to-reel tapes. I don't listen to them anymore because I know they were just stupid. You know, they, a Trinitarian will tell you that the Trinity can't be explained. There's a reason for that. It doesn't exist. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and all thy soul and with all thy might. And these words which I commanded this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. And shall talk of them when thou sittest in thy house. And when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down and when thou risest up. This doctrine is the oneness doctrine, what Moses gave us here. Theologians call it the... Uh, law of first mention or the law of first occurrence. When you study theology, you learn that in the early stages of the scripture, when a doctrine is first defined, then it follows that definition throughout the Bible. And so it is inconceivable if Moses taught us in the law of first mention that God is only one Lord, that in the New Testament he would end up being three Lords. Y'all believe that? Now if you are a Trinitarian here today, then uh, I, I'm mindful of you. I know that not everybody here is going to believe everything I say. I'm asking you to bear with me. I'm asking you to keep your heart and mind open. I'm not attacking anybody, but I'm, I'm here to tell you what the Bible says. And if it's something you've never heard before, well, deal with it. Amen. Let the word of the Lord have free course. What do you say? Moses' doctrine was oneness doctrine. He commanded us from these earliest biblical writings to make the doctrine of the oneness of God the absolute top priority of all our entire religious experience and practice. He told us to teach it to our children. He told us to discuss it with our families and friends. We must mention it throughout the days of our lives. Therefore, if God is only one Lord in the Old Testament, it's inconceivable he would be three Lords in the New Testament. We've got a gentleman here from Bethlehem, and uh, I can tell you that if you've been to Israel, you're going to see a little thing on the door, all over the doors in Israel. It's called a mezuzah. And that mezuzah has a little scroll handwritten inside of it. And it has verses from Deuteronomy chapter 6 rolled up in it. And they nail that little box on the door. And when they go in and out of that door, they kiss that little mezuzah and say, the Lord is one. Everybody say, the Lord is one. I'm going to show you incontrovertible historical evidence that the early church was oneness. Amen. I feel like it's necessary to at least present a definition of the oneness doctrine before I go into all the other proofs that I'm going to show you here today. I gave them the title for this sermon. It may be too big for the, for the screen. The title of this, the early church was absolutely unequivocally not Trinitarian. Is that plain enough? There was not a Trinitarian in the Bible. Not one. Not, not one, nothing. Almighty God is only one eternal, invisible, indivisible, omniscient, omnipotent spirit who was known in the Old Testament as Yahweh or Jehovah. So the spirit of Jehovah is that one true God. And Jesus Christ is the incarnation of that one spirit. When I say incarnation, that means an inf enfleshment or an embodiment. How many of you understand God is invisible? Sonship is the product of conception. We've got a lot of folks out here that believe the son was eternal. The eternal sonship is a fallacy. It's completely unsubstantiated in the scriptures. The fact of it is, if you have a son in heaven, then you have to have a mother in heaven. And y'all understand sonship is, comes by conception and gestation and childbirth. 
If there had been an eternal son in heaven, there would have had to been a God the mother. And she would have had to be conceived by God the father and she would have had to produce a God the son. That is not what happened. And we got some new age gurus around here that takes the word Shekinah and say, well, that's the female aspect of God. Don't believe that. That's all cabalism. That's all mysticism. The Holy Ghost is the spirit of God. And he's a male. Amen? So the Son of God did not begin until he was conceived humanly and bodily in the womb of Mary. Before Jesus was conceived as a human, God was bodiless. Only but only a spirit, one undivided spirit. God only begot that one child in all of eternity. That's why Jesus taught in John three sixteen that he is the only begotten son. The only time a child was ever conceived was in the womb of Mary, and God did it. The Holy Ghost did it. And that human child was the only begotten son of God. There was no spirit. God said, I'm not gonna give my glory to another. There's not a Jehovah Junior. There's not a Jehovah the Second. There's not a clone of God the Father. When Jesus said, I and my father are one, he said, when you've seen me, you've seen the father. That don't mean I look like him. That don't mean we're, I'm a spitting image of the father. It means I am the father, right? It makes perfect sense. The Holy Ghost is not the third person of an imaginary trinity. God the father is a spirit. Does anybody deny that? He's also holy. I guess that makes him Holy Spirit. God the Father is holy. The Holy Ghost is holy. Both of them claim to be the Father of Jesus Christ. They must be the same. Did it ever occur to you there's not a single conversation in the entire Bible between the Father and the Holy Ghost? That's because there's not two. The Father is the Holy Ghost. The Father is ghost, he's spirit, and that spirit is what's in Jesus Christ. When Jesus came told him, he said, he that is with you shall be in you on the day of Pentecost when they got the Holy Ghost. What they got was the Spirit of Christ. What they got was God. They got all of God. Paul said, Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. If God is three people, then there's three people in Jesus. That's, that don't make any sense. So the Father is the Holy Ghost. And Jesus is the body of the fullness of God. The Spirit dwells in him. When we finally stand before the throne of God one of these days in heaven, we're not going to see three thrones. We're not going to see two thrones. I had one of these date commentary Bibles. I used it for many years. And he was a Trinitarian. And uh, he had charts and pictures back in the back of that Bible. And one chart had a picture of heaven with three thrones in it. And the next page or two over, he had another picture and it had heaven with two thrones and a dove. And in the next picture, he had a picture of one throne in heaven. I, you know what I decided? I figured he didn't know who God was. John said, I saw a throne set in heaven and one set on it. In another place, he said, it's the throne of God and of the Lamb. How can you get God and the Lamb and still have one? Because God is a spirit and the Lamb is the man, Jesus, in whom the Father dwells. When you see Jesus on the throne, you remember Moses had prayed, I want to see your glory, God. He never did see God's glory in his day. But when Jesus came, God raised Moses from the dead and stood him up on the mountain and said, here he is. This is the glory of God. This is God in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Somebody say hallelujah. God and the Lamb are one sitting on one throne. If you see Jesus, you see the Lamb, but you also see God, the fullness of God in Christ. Jesus said, I and my Father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Did Jesus really mean that he and the Father were the same person, or did it just mean something abstract? I'm telling you, there is no other way of seeing it. The Apostle Paul taught us the oneness doctrine. He taught us that God has one image, and that is Jesus Christ. God has only one body, and that is Jesus Christ. God is an invisible spirit, and his only body is Jesus. If you had never seen the body of Jesus, you never saw God. Now, you had clouds and smoke and pillars of smoke. You had theophanies. You had angelic appearances, the angels of the Lord, and various sundry uh, manifestations in the Old Testament. But none of them carried the name of God. None of them purported to be God. They were all emissaries or ambassadors for God. They were not the bodily manifestation of God. 
Again and again, God emphatically declares that he's solitary. He said, I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself. Do you get that? There's no two people in the Godhead or three people in the Godhead. Every decision he made, he made by himself. Every act he ever committed, he did it by himself. God doesn't need help. He doesn't need a second member of the Godhead to carry out his business. He didn't need two or three other gods to go with him or two or three other lords to go with him to create the heavens and the earth. He said, I did it by myself. I did it alone. How much plainer can it be? There's no plurals in any of those statements. If you want to see exactly what God looked like in eternity past, then just look back into eternity and you'll see his original form. Take away everything, everything that God ever created. Take away the heavens and the earth. Take away the stars, the sun, the moon. Take away heaven. The Bible says city built four square, isn't it? Was there a time there was no city of heaven? Sure. David said in the 103rd Psalm, Thou hast prepared thy throne in heaven. Even the throne of God is not eternal. God made that throne. Are you with me? If you take away every single thing that God ever created, you know what you'll have? You'll have nothing but a pitch black of darkness in all of eternity. And there is God. He's a spirit. Say he's a spirit. He's, you're not going to see three men walking out there in the middle of space somewhere. Having a powwow. There's, it's not a triumvirate. It's a spirit, and he's the one that made you and me. Jesus created the fact that God is invisible. He told the Pharisees, you've neither hear, heard his voice at any time nor seen his shape. You've never seen his shape. God does not have a shape. John declared, no man has seen God at any time. Jesus is the only embodiment of God. John said he was the word made flesh. And don't tell me the word is separate from God. The Bible says the word is God. They try to make the word out to be a separate person from the father. That's nonsense. That's crazy. The word is God. And Jesus is the incarnation of the word. That's why he was tempted at all points like we were yet without sin. Because he lived by the word. All his rules were the word of God. Every thought he had was by the word of God. Every desire he had was subject to the word of God. The word of God made him what he was because he was the word of God. And that's what we need to be. We need to be the, the repository of everything that was in Jesus Christ, conformed to his image, full of his word, full of his spirit. And that's how we overcome sin, is by getting his spirit in us and what, living and walking in that spirit. Amen. Philip asked Jesus, show us the Father. Jesus said, have I been so long time with you and you haven't known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. Jesus is... God's only body. He is the fullness of him that filleth all in all, Ephesians 1.23. John 1.10 says he was in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not. When Caiaphas, that high priest, sentenced him to die, he had no idea. I mean, this is the guy. Caiaphas had offered sacrifices and they'd let blood flow and they'd run that temple all his life in, in hopes of the coming of Messiah. They, they had taught that Messiah would be God incarnate. And yet when he looked in the face of Jesus, he didn't believe that was him and he killed him to death. God came unto his own and his own received him not. But to as many as received him, to them gave you the power to become the sons of God. That's you and me here today. To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. 2 Corinthians 5, 19. Paul described the mystery to Timothy. God was manifest in the flesh. Colossians 2, 9. In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. That is the deity. The word Godhead doesn't mean many members either. He came unto his own and his own received him not. The invisible God suddenly appeared and they did not know who he was. Isaiah prophesied that his name would be Emmanuel, which means God with us. He's the image. Paul taught the Corinthian church that Jesus is the image of God. He taught the Colossian church that the Son is the image of the invisible God. In Colossians 1.19, it pleased the Father that in him, speaking of the Son, should all the Father's fullness dwell. That's why John said the Word was made flesh. Jesus is Jehovah's Savior, come in the flesh. In fact, the very meaning of the name Jesus is Jehovah's Savior. Jesus explained, I'm come in my Father's name. The name Jesus is the name of the Father. The Father is 
God, the Son, is a man. Jesus said, my Father is greater than I. Everybody says, well, how come, how come Jesus talked to the Father and Jesus and the Father talked to God if they're not two? If there's no trinity, then how come they talk to each other? Because God is God and a man is a man. But Jesus said, my Father is greater than I. Why did he say my Father is greater than I? Because he was a man. When he said... When he said some things I don't know, only the Father knows, he was saying as, he was speaking as a man. There's nothing co-equal or co-eternal about the Son. If that was the case, Jesus wouldn't have said, my Father's greater than I. If he was co-equal and co-eternal with the Father, he wouldn't have made that statement. The oneness of God is the eternal doctrine of God, and it's the doctrine believed and preached by everybody in the early church. You believe that? The oneness doctrine says that the eternal, invisible spirit of the Father is in the human body of Christ. God is in Christ. God the Father never invented or created God the Son. That's a blasphemous, heretical misnomer. The phrase God the Son never occurs in the Bible. The Son of God was made of a woman, not in eternity's past, but in the fullness of time. And conceived of the Holy Ghost. Get that, conceived of the Holy Ghost, Matthew 1 and 20. If the Holy Ghost conceived Jesus, and then Luke 1.35, the angel answered and said unto her, the Holy Ghost, everybody say the Holy Ghost, shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. That's twice where the scripture tells us, and there's another third time, where the scripture tells us that Jesus was conceived by the Holy Ghost. Now, if the Holy Ghost is the third person of the Trinity, then the third person of the Trinity is the Father. And if the third person is the Father, who's the first person? Did I lose you? The Holy Ghost is the Father. Conceived of the Holy Ghost means the Holy Ghost is the Father. It means the Spirit of God is the Father. In Matthew 1, 20, the angel told Joseph, Fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived of in her is of the Holy Ghost. That clearly shows us that the Holy Ghost is actually the Father, since John said the Son of Man is the only begotten of the Father. Why didn't he say he's the only begotten of the Holy Ghost and left the, left the Father out of it? Because the Holy Ghost and the Father are the same thing. And I know most of you know this, but if you don't know that today, it's time for you to learn it. It's absolutely impossible to reconcile these Bible verses apart from the doctrine of the oneness of God. Furthermore, if God's a trinity in three persons and Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead bodily, then there would have to be three complete persons inside the body of Jesus Christ, and that is nothing but absurdity. God is not three persons. People say, Trinitarians will say, we don't believe in three gods. Well, let's, let's deal with that for a second. God said, I'm the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. That's the Father talking, right? The Father is the Lord. The Old Testament teaches us that the, whole, that the Father God is the Lord, right? But then the New Testament tells us that one of these days, every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus is the Lord. And then there's another verse that said, now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. So the Holy Ghost is the Lord. So if there's a Trinity there, we got three Lords. Because the Father said He was the Lord, and the New Testament tells us that the Son is the Lord, and the Holy Ghost is also the Lord. We, there's only one way to understand that, and that is to understand that God is one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Now I'm telling you something. Most churches in this city don't believe that. And the fact that you're here sets you apart, not just in, because you got a different church, but because you got the truth. You're not going to be saved without the truth. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. You're not going to be made free by lying doctrine. Nobody ever got saved by false doctrine. The early church preached and believed the oneness doctrine well into the fourth century. Here's where I want to really get down. Ignatius was the bishop of Antioch. The Ignatius of Antioch was called the disciple of the apostles. Ignatius spoke of Jesus in the epistle of Polycarp, chapter 1, verse 15. He said, expect him who is above all time, eternal, invisible, though for our sakes made visible, impalpable, which means intangible, and impassable, 
which means not capable of experiencing pain, yet for us, subject to sufferings, endured all manner of ways for our salvation. So Ignatius was telling us that Jesus Christ is the suffering body of a God who cannot suffer. God had to embody. God can't die. He had to take on the form of a man to die. You can't kill God, but you can kill the Son of God. And they did. But he came up from the grave because greater is he that's in you. The power of God raised him. And when Jesus came up, Moses had taught his way back down to that the life of the body is in the blood. But when Jesus got up, there wasn't no blood in him. It was all Holy Ghost. And that's the same thing that's going to animate you and me when the trumpet sounds. That Holy Ghost that you got here in this altar is going to raise you from the dead one of these days. That Holy Ghost you got is the same spirit that filled Jesus Christ. It's the same spirit that filled the upper room. And it's going to get you, up out, you and me up out of the grave or in the rapture one of these days. You better love this thing. Polycarp of Smyrna in the year 69 to 155 AD was a disciple of the apostle John. Polycarp endorsed Ignatius' teachings, calling him an example of holiness and urged the Philippians to follow his example. So Polycarp consented to this oneness doctrine of Ignatius. Then there were theologians who began to call the oneness people modalists. And this whole subject of modalism is controversial, but it's what they called they said they don't believe that, they said modalists don't believe that God is eternally existent in three persons, but he's eternally existent in three modes. Well, in fact, God doesn't even have three modes. God is a spirit. And he's got a human body. That's, the, that's two modes. He's, got, he's divine and he's human. So much for modalism. But when you hear people, theologians talk about modalism, they're talking about us. They're talking about us because we don't believe God is three people, Right? Noetus was another church father who lived around 130 AD. He was said to be a modalist, that is oneness. In reality, God does not have three modes. The historian Hippolytus said that Noetus believed that Jesus confessed himself to be the son to those who saw him, while to those who could receive it, he did not hide the fact that he was the father. How'd you like to be in that inner circle that he confessed to them? I'm the father. That's what was so great about Thomas's confession. When he put his hand in, the, in that nail print side, or in that scar on his side, and said, my Lord and my God. Yes. Whenever, whenever Paul was headed to Damascus, and the, and the power of God knocked him down and blinded him, that voice spake from heaven in the Hebrew tongue. And Paul said, who art thou, Lord? And this is a man, he's a highly educated Jew, trained in all the things of the law. And when that voice from heaven spoke to him in the Hebrew language, he was expecting it to be the voice of the Father. But it said, I'm Jesus, whom thou persecutest. If the Father tells you I'm Jesus, you better believe it. I said, if the Father tells you I'm Jesus, you better believe it. Irenaeus was another church father who lived around 135 to 200 AD. He said, the father is that which is invisible about the son, and the son is that which is visible about the father. I like that one. So the father is God revealing himself, and the son is God revealed. Praxius, around 150 to 200 AD, who was arguably, uh, he was a friend of Tertullian, who was arguably the first Trinitarian, compared Praxis in 152, uh, saying that Jesus is God and Father Almighty. So this guy Tertullian, you gotta understand, Tertullian was one of the first Trinitarians, but even in his day, he admitted that there were more oneness people around than there were Trinities. Sibelius in 180 AD taught that the Father and the Son are the same. You see, I'm telling you that the church, the early church was not t Trinitarian. Absolutely, unequivocally, not Trinitarian. There was no Trinitarian. These, these Trinitarian guys were Johnny come lately. They got no place, they got no part or lot in this thing. The church belongs to the oneness Jesus name apostolic people. Am I telling you the truth? Tertullian said that oneness apostolics always constitute the majority of believers. 
He even refused to call them unwise or unlearned. Zephyrinus, who was the bishop of Rome in 210 AD, said, I know one God, Christ Jesus. And beside him, I know no others. That sounds like oneness to me. Callistus, the bishop of Rome in 220 AD, said, the word, the word is the Son himself, the Father himself. There is only one and the same indivisible spirit. The Father is not one and the Son another. They are one and the same. Y'all, I'm going to tell you, when I first got converted to this stuff, I was riding down the road one day and I thought of that verse that said, the Lord shall go forth as a mighty man. And that's where it really dawned on me. Jesus Christ is the Father come down. The Lord shall go forth as a mighty man. He shall cry, yea, he shall roar. He shall prevail against his enemies. Jesus is our God. He's not, he's not the incarnation of the second person of Trinity. He's the incarnation of the fullness of God. Eusebius was a Catholic historian who was present at the Council of Nicaea in 325. In his lifetime, his writings sometimes depicted oneness theology, while at other times he seemed to be a Trinitarian, leaving us uncertain about exactly what Eusebius believed. But Eusebius wrote about the error of Berilius. Berilius, who was the bishop of Bostra in Arabia around 240, taught that our Lord and Savior did not exist as a distinct person before the incarnation and that the divinity of the Father dwelled in Christ. Others have called Berilius a monarchian. That means he believed that Jesus was the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Dionysius in 265 AD, the Bishop of Rome, complained about those who divide and cut to pieces that most sacred doctrine of the church of God, the divine monarchy, making it as if there were three powers and part of substances and God heads three. He was nailing it. Don't come telling me God's got three different power bases. Don't tell me there's three different substances to God. The Lord our God is one Lord. If you ever get Deuteronomy 6 in your gut, you'll never believe all that other junk. So in other words, in 265 AD, the bishop of Rome contend, condemned the doctrine of the Trinity. The Nicene Creed in 325 AD was the first official Trinitarian doctrine published for the first time in history in 325. The new Trinitarian Roman Catholic Church of Rome demanded that all oneness monotheistic Jesus name believers be rebaptized as Trinitarians in the titles Father, Son, and Holy Spirit or have all their property confiscated. I got a reason for telling you this. I'm telling you Rome is our enemy. I'm gonna preach a little prophecy here tonight and you'll see a little bit clearly what I'm talking about. I'm gonna tell you something, that Trinity doctrine is damnable. I said that Trinity doctrine is a great enemy of God. I said here the other night, the devil's a squatter. The devil likes to, to sit down on places that God claims. In Isaiah 14, he said, I'm gonna exalt, the devil said, I'll exalt my throne above the stars of God and I'll sit in the mound of the congregation on the sides of the north. The devil always wanted to sit in God's place and the devil always wants to replace true doctrine with false doctrine. You and I gotta open up our eyes and open up our ears and study to show ourselves approved unto God. Workmen that need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We can't be dupes. Don't listen to everything everybody preaches. Just because a preacher's got a big crowd and a big following and millions of dollars don't mean he's telling you the truth. You gotta love the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Elsewise, you're going to be deceived. you got to love truth above all else. Rome declared war on oneness people. I said Rome declared war. That early church didn't apostatize. They didn't get discouraged and quit. They didn't lose the faith or think that what they believed believing was wrong. You know what happened? The Catholics murdered them. I said the Catholics murdered them. Yes. Not just a few. History tells us that the Catholic Church has murdered no less than 60 million people didn't believe Catholicism. Some estimates run as high as 100 million. That don't sound like the Church of Jesus Christ to me. That sounds like the Church of the Devil. I said, well, you shouldn't speak evil of anybody. I'll speak evil of the devil any day I want to. Yeah. 
because he about there destroyed me. I almost went to hell over this false doctrine. And I got a lot of my loved ones that's going for it right now. They were raised up in apostolic churches and they're going after this junk. And some of y'all, if y'all keep watching all these TV preachers, you're going to be outside looking in one of these days. Yeah, you're going to say, well, I don't see what's wrong with the trendy. Well, when you say that, you're done. You're cooked. Your goose is cooked. You're over. When you quit believing that Jesus is the mighty God, you done messed up, buddy. He said he wouldn't share his glory with anybody. Is this too strong or what? Pastor can fix the mess I make when I'm going, I guess. The Roman Catholic Church caused many oneness believers to go underground, that is to go into hiding. But in 380, Marcellus of Ansura with Photinus, who was Marcellus' disciple and Priscillian, still contended that the Christian faith is in Father, Son, and Spirit, one God in Christ. He is God, Son of God, and Savior. In Christ, the Father is known. Marcellus added, God is invisible. None has seen him at any time, so he came in name and form as such as he could make himself known. He was, of course, referring to Jesus Christ. And then in 400 AD, Commodianus said, a, a Christian poet named Commodius said, the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost are different designations to the same person. We're not the only people who ever believed this. Bacchiaris, Bacarius, in 450 AD, Bacarius of Galatia held what was called a Sabellian view, that is a oneness view of the Godhead. In 1121, we're getting up closer to modern times, Peter Abelard, a French scholastic philosopher, theologian, and preeminent logician, was known to be oneness. He was charged with heresy by the Roman Catholic Synod of Soissons and shut up in the convent of St. Medard. The Chamber's Biographical Dictionary called Peter Abelard the keenest thinker and boldest theologian of the 12th century. And he was oneness like you and me. And then there was this guy, Michael Servetus, who was one of my great heroes. Michael Servetus. In 1531, Michael Servetus published a paper entitled The Error of the Trinity in which he expounded the doctrine of the oneness of God. For that paper, he was burned at the stake. And I got oneness stuff all over the internet. If you've been to my website, I've got thousands and thousands and thousands of apostolic oneness articles. And I don't doubt but one of these days they're going to come after me too because I'm an enemy of the state. But you know what? I'd rather, I'd rather die for this thing than live without it. Y'all hear me? And don't you, think the, don't you think the Crusades and the Inquisitions are over? They still hate Pentecostals. You go to Guatemala down there, they're killing Pentecostals. You go down to South America, and the Catholic Church is giving true Pentecostals all kind of fits. They're trying to sell this charismatic thing, which is a cheap substitute for Pentecost. Don't you buy it. It's not the same thing. I done been there and done that. Michael Servita said, Christ is in the Father as a voice from the speaker. He, is, he and the Father are one as the ray and the sun are one light. An amazing mystery is that God can thus be conjoined with man and man with God. A great wonder that he has taken to himself the body of Christ, that it should be his peculiar dwelling place. Servetus also said that Christ manifests God to us, being the expression of his very being, and through him alone, God can be known. And then we had this Trinitarian dude named John Calvin. You ever heard of him? You see... Martin Luther and John Calvin and, and uh, some of these other guys that broke away from the Catholic Church, they didn't go far enough. They renounced the Pope and they renounced a few other things, but they didn't renounce the worst thing in the whole Catholic Church, and that's that false trinity doctrine. If you're going to get out of it, get out of it. If you're going to quit a thing, quit it. Don't hang on to half of it. Hello? John Calvin argued with Michael Servetus by letter until their debate became quite heated. Calvin told Servetus that if he ever met him, he was going to have to turn him over to the authorities and have him sentenced to death by the inquisitors. 
Well, sure as the world, Servetus came to town and sure as the world, John Calvin had him put to death for being nothing but a oneness Pentecost. Many other writers and orators took up Servetus' cause. Isn't that the wonder of God you can kill a... <laughs> they killed our Messiah, but they didn't kill our religion. He rose from the dead and they killed, they killed Stephen, they killed Paul, and they killed Peter. You can't stomp this thing out. You knock one down and ten will rise up where he was. In 1668, a man named William Penn, who incidentally is the founder of the state of Pennsylvania, was imprisoned in the Tower of London for writing a powerful anti-Trinitarian tract called the Sandy Foundation Shaken, in which he declared, must I de deny his divinity because I justly reject the popish school personality? It is manifest then that though I may deny the trinity of separate persons in one Godhead, yet I do not consequently deny the deity of Jesus Christ. Amen. William Penn also declared that the Roman Catholic Church was the whore of Babylon. And he was in prison for that. You know, it, 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 don't get too comfortable with this stuff. It ain't meant to be comfortable. This is a battlefield, brother. It's not a recreation room. This is a fight. It's not a game. If you're too happy all the time, you better pray through. You're living in a dream world. You're living in denial of some stuff. I'm going to tell you, they that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. If you stand for something, everybody that don't like what you stand for is going to hit you. Jesus said, they'll persecute you for my name's sake. If you believe the truth, when you take God's side, you take all his enemies. And I'm well aware of that. I know that by my standing for what I stand for, that everybody don't agree with me would like to just take me down. They'd like to shut me up and say, we don't like your doctrine. We don't like you. Somebody told me on the internet last night, you take your religion too seriously. You know what I did? I blocked her. <laughs> don't tell me I take my religion too seriously. Hell is a long time. And I don't want to go there. I want to do what's right. I'm gonna preach the truth till Jesus come. Till my last breath, I'm gonna preach this one God, Jesus name, doctrine. <laughs> Emmanuel Swedenborg around 1749 said, Jesus is the redeemer and savior. He came in the world as to his humanity, he called himself Jesus Christ. Jehovah himself came into the world and became the savior and redeemer. That's one God doctrine, isn't it? Dr. Nathaniel Emmons around 1800 a Yale graduate and leading New England theologian of his time taught that we should cast aside the eternal generation of the Son, a doctrine that had originated with Origen and one of the earliest premises of Trinitarianism. Emmons believed that the Father and the Son were both terms referring to the one absolute God. In 1819, William Ellery Channing said, we have the doctrine of the Trinity. He impugned it as illogical and unscriptural because it implies that God is three intelligent agents possessed of different consciousness, different wills, and different perceptions, performing different acts, and sustaining different relations. To us, as to the apostle and primitive Christians, there is only one God, even the Father. With Jesus, we worship the Father as the only living and true God. H.B. Smith in 1875, a Presbyterian clergyman and teacher for 24 years, said the only supreme personality exists in three personal modes of being but is not three distinct persons. Henry Ward Beecher in 1860 said Jesus Christ is his name and all there is of God is bound up in that name. John Miller in 1880 said, wrote a book called Is God a Trinity? He asked the question, is the deity that is in Christ the second person of the Trinity or the one personal Jehovah? For the Trinitarian believes but in one of three persons in Christ, whereas we believe in the sole person of the Almighty. Jesus is called the Father in Isaiah. In, in Isaiah, he said, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and his name shall be called the Everlasting Father. You want it plain enough? The Bible said the Son is the Father. Is that plain enough for you? The Son is the Father. Jesus is specifically called the Son in Romans 1 and 3. His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Jesus is specifically called the Holy Ghost in 2 Corinthians. The Lord is that Spirit. 
Oneness apostolics have existed since the days of Jesus, but not Trinitarians. No Trinitarians existed in Jesus' day. Not one single Trinitarian existed on the day of Pentecost. Nobody was ever baptized in the Bible in the titles Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Nobody. If getting baptized in Jesus' name is heresy, then the New Testament is heresy. Because everybody in the New Testament got baptized in Jesus' name. And so I said, well, I'd rather obey Jesus than Peter. Oh, yeah, really? So Peter's wrong? John MacArthur, the famous Baptist preacher, was asking an interview, can you be a Christian if you deny the Trinity? To which he replied, I would answer no. If you don't believe in the Trinity, then you don't understand who God is. You may say the word God, but you don't understand his nature. To John MacArthur, I reply, if you think that God is a trinity, then you don't really understand who God is. You may say the word God, but you don't really understand his nature. The Lord our God is one Lord, and you ain't ever going to get around that. You see, Rome has always been an enemy of the church. Romans killed Jesus. Romans killed Peter upside down on the cross. Romans cut off Paul's head. Romans destroyed Jerusalem. Romans ransacked the holy temple. Romans under Titus took all the holy temple vessels to Rome. They built the Arch of Titus to commemorate it. They built the Colosseum in Rome with the treasures of the holy temple. The Romans took thousands, tens of thousands of Christians to the Colosseum and let them go to the lions and watch them eat and devoured by wild animals for no other reason than they were Christians and they wouldn't be Roman Catholics. By the turn of the third century, the apostolic Pentecostal holiness church that Jesus had founded had been almost wiped off the map. Not because they didn't believe it, but because the enemies killed them. Irenaeus was the man who first conceptualized the doctrine of the, the false doctrine of the eternal son. Justin Martyr had said that Jesus is in second place to the father. Can anybody explain to me what that's supposed to mean? What, what, what does it mean, Jesus in the second place of the Father? That's a Trinitarian concept. It's totally foreign to the Bible. Jesus is not second place to anybody. He said, I'm Alpha and Omega. I'm the first and last. Jesus, no, he's not in second place to anybody. Y'all believe that? He's not the incarnation of the second person of the Trinity. He's the incarnation of everything God is. He's the fullness of God. The apostle Thomas called Jesus my Lord and my God. And for a Jew, that meant that Thomas believed that his, this was the Father in the flesh. That's a mighty big statement. You think about that. For a man, for an ordinary man to look in the face of Jesus Christ and say, my Lord and my God. That's, that's incomprehensible. But he believed it because it rose from the dead. And John who'd leaned on Jesus' breast all of his three years of ministry. Closest, he'd been all the way from, John started out with John the Baptist, he followed Jesus all through, he heard every sermon he preached, saw every miracle he worked. He followed him to the Gethsemane, he was with him at Caiaphas' house, he was there at, the, at, at uh, Golgotha, he visited the tomb. John was, was the intimate of intimates. And you know what he said in the book of Revelation? The worlds were made by him. I don't, I don't say that to anybody but Jesus. The world was made by that man. You believe that? So there are two natures. To be exact, God in Christ has two natures, a spirit and a flesh. God is greater, the Son is less, but that's not two distinct persons and certainly not two identical deities. What I want to close with is the concept that this has, uh, the, 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 the impact that this concept of the oneness of God has on the plan of salvation because that is where... The rubber meets the road. When you think that God is in three spirits, when you teach and believe that God is the Father, God is the Son, God is the Holy Ghost, then that's where people get the idea that if you accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, that you receive the Spirit of Christ. And if later on after you get in church and stay a while, you can go and get the baptism of the Holy Ghost, which they say is a separate work of grace. 
they'll tell you, you tune, you tune in Joel Osteen, and at the end of every one of his programs, he's going to say about a 15-second person, we want everybody to get saved today, and he's going to say, uh, I, Lord, I accept you as my personal Savior. Forgive me of my sins. I'll make you Lord of my life. And then he'll say, now we believe you're born again. That's where I'm ready to kick the screen in. That is not how you get born again. You must be born of the water and of the spirit. You gotta be baptized in the name of Jesus. There is no other name given unto heaven among men whereby we must be saved. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's Jesus. When you get the Holy Ghost, you get Jesus. If you didn't get the Holy Ghost, you didn't get Jesus. Easy believism is a church of hell. People going to hell believing this easy believism stuff. The Bible, Jesus said many in that day are going to say, Lord, didn't we cast out many devils in your name? Didn't we heal the sick and raise the dead and do many mighty works? And he's going to say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. In another place he said, not everybody says to me, Lord, Lord, is going in. Now, do we believe that or not? Or we just pass over that stuff and say, oh, they don't mean what he said. You know what? You know what they said in the, in the uh, Romans 8? Verse 19, they said, uh, show us your father. Verse 19. In verse 24, John 8, he said, if you don't believe I'm he, you're going to die in your sins. Did y'all get that? They said, where's your father? And he said, if you don't believe I'm the father. You said, I don't know why you got to preach all this doctrine on Sunday morning. We come to get a blessing. But this is a source of all blessing right here. He said, if you don't believe I'm the Father, you're going to die in your sin. You know what that means? If you believe God's a trinity, you're going to die in your sin. I don't know if you've heard that before, but I said it. And I believe it. You say, well, there's just too many Christians out here that believe the trinity. I can't believe God's going to send them all to hell. Well, then you don't believe the Bible. Because there'll be a lot of people in hell, y'all. And there's going to be a lot of people that said the name of Jesus is going to go to hell. There's going to be a lot of people thought they were saved. They ain't, going to go, they ain't going to make it. If you want this thing, I know this is year 2015 and I know we're modern and we got nice cars and carpeted floors and all this kind of stuff. But let me tell you something. If you don't have a love for this book, if you don't read and pray and study your Bible, you ain't going to make it. Because there's too many voices out there, too many temptations. Everything's going to lead you this way and that way. And you'll never, you've got to have a love for God that supersedes everything else in this world. Your desire for truth, Lord, I want the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me, God. Let's stand. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In the 7th century, the Athanasian Creed replaced the Nicene Creed. In 1712, the most diabolical words ever written. Here are some excerpts. Listen carefully. This is words that's in the Roman Catholic Athanasian Creed. Whosoever will be saved before all things, it is necessary that he hold the Catholic faith. Before you start shooting off about us apostolics thinking we're the only ones, I'm going to tell you something. The Catholics think they're the only ones. didn't know that, did you? Or did you? Did you know the Baptists have got their own doctrinal statement and they believe they're the ones? Now, what are you going to believe? You're just going to believe whatever has the biggest following or are you going to believe what the Bible says? Praise God. The, the Athanasian Creed said, Whosoever will be saved before all things, it's necessary to hold the Catholic faith. Which faith, except everyone do keep whole and undefiled, without doubt, he shall perish everlasting. And the Catholic faith is this, that we worship the one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity. For there is one person of the Father, another of the Son, and another of the Holy Spirit. 
So we were forbidden by the Catholic religion to say there are three gods or three lords. And in this trinity, none, are four, none is a four or after another. None is greater or less than another. Do you realize what a contradiction these statements are? Do you realize these, abs- you know what an oxymoron is, right? It's something that just don't make sense. It contradicts itself. It's, it's, just, self, it's just self-denying. These statements are self-denying. And he, therefore, that will be saved must thus think of the Trinity. This is the Catholic faith, which except a man believe faithfully, he cannot be saved. This is the first creed in which the equality of three persons of the Trinity is explicitly stated. And the horrible thing of it was that with the Athanasian Creed and the raw and enormous political power and influence of the Roman Church, they set out to kill off every oneness apostolic that they could find. That's why the Bible calls it a whore church. And I, I'm going to tell you something. And, and I, give, I give as much credit to Martin Luther and Calvin and all those guys for having the guts to walk out on the Pope. But they didn't walk far enough. They didn't go far enough. And it's not good enough that you get in here and just join this fellowship and sing and dance with everybody. you got to get a revelation of God. you got to know him. How many of you understand this is about knowing God? And you can, come, you, can know every, you can have a perfectly horizontal relationship with everybody in here and not even know God. I know I'm telling the truth. You can be in perfect good stand with everybody in this church and not even know God. That's why it is so great. When you get the Holy Ghost... Because when you get the Holy Ghost, you get the fullness of God bodily. <laughs> You're getting Jesus. Jesus said, I will not leave you, you comfortless. I will come to you. He said, he that is with you shall be in you. When you get the Holy Ghost, you got Jesus. If you didn't get the Holy Ghost, you didn't get Jesus. Let's worship everybody. Hallelujah. Whoa, hallelujah. If you need the Holy Ghost today, this would be a good time and place to get it. If you don't have the Holy Ghost, you need to check your oil right now. Hallelujah, hallelujah. 